Transforming Banking, Part 1, Game Changer. Now, in the very darkest days of the global financial crisis, this is immediately following the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Shares for many companies were hit hard. The global economy went into deep recession. And all of the sectors of the economy felt the impacts, especially retailers. People who had just lost their jobs or were in danger of losing their jobs did not have money to spend. And so for many of the retailers, particularly in the United States, that spelled the end. Even online retailers who had been doing very well, even they felt the pinch. The largest of those, Amazon, saw its stock price drop 50% in that year. With the world's biggest economy stuck in economic doldrums, the near future looked very grim. Yet all was not as it seemed. Some individuals seem particularly tuned to the way that the new connected economy works, and perhaps none of those more so than Jeff Bezos, the founder and the CEO of Amazon.com. In 1995, Amazon began disrupting a long-established distribution chain for books, and then in 2007 disrupted the printing process with the introduction of the Kindle, and then, with Kindle Direct Publishing, they even disrupted the relationship between the author and the audience. They removed the frictions of the publisher. And because of Amazon's innovation, anyone can publish a book at any time and get to a global audience pretty much within a few minutes. Since its, since its inception, Amazon has continuously improved what it offers. It develops a cleaner and quicker and more frictionless path from author to audience. The Amazon of 2015 is a far cry from the Amazon of 1995. Its biggest innovation was the single click that allowed you to purchase something. But business has done more than just transform and disrupt publishing. He's worked as hard to transform and disrupt his own business. Amazon disrupts its own business before competitors get a look in. Now, that's a hard game to play, but it's one that short circuits competitive innovations before they become a threat to his business. Now, back in 2002, Bezos sent around a memo to all Amazon employees. He outlined a new direction for the organization, and in it, he mandated that every part of the organization rethink itself as a set of services that could be employed by other parts of the organization. The memo set out the following. One, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. All teams must communicate with each other through those interfaces. There will be no other form of inter-process communication. There will be no direct linking. There will be, be no direct reads of an, another team's data store. So no peeking behind the scenes. No shared memory model. No backdoors whatsoever. The only communication allowed is via service calls over the network. Doesn't matter what technology this stuff uses. And all of the service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. That is to say, the team must plan and design to be able to expose interfaces to folks in the outside world. And there are no exceptions to this. So if we strip out the modestly technical language that Bezos used, and remember Bezos is not a geek, he's a businessman, he's made a request of all of Amazon's divisions to reinvent themselves as services that can be consumed by other divisions or by anyone outside Amazon. And to underline the seriousness of this diktat, Bezos closed his memo with, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Have a nice day. And as Amazon's monolithic business started to fish in into a suite of services, what happened was there was some hidden assets that started to shine through. Amazon had a vast infrastructure of internet-connected servers. They were mostly lie lying idle, waiting for Christmas to come. But it was realized that they could be offered up as a service, both internally 
and to customers outside Amazon. And so Amazon Web Services, which was launched in 2006, has now become the backbone of very successful web companies like Dropbox and Twitter. By today, 2015, something like 80% of technology startups worldwide rent computer power from Amazon. And renting has dramatically lowered the costs to build that kind of business, which has led to an explosion in tech startups, which has created more demand for Amazon Web Services. And that, that virtuous cycle is showing no sign of slowing down. Amazon is building new data centers all around the world, including here in Sydney, pretty much as fast as they can find space and power for them. And although the profits for that division aren't broken out into Amazon's financial reports, if they sold it off, it's estimated that Amazon Web Services would be worth around $50 billion. Now, Amazon offers a streaming movie service, Amazon Instant Video. It has a big catalog of films. Amazon Web Services' biggest client is a company called Netflix which offers exactly the same service, and it does it far more successfully than Amazon. It's estimated that about a third of the internet traffic in the United States after eight o'clock at night is Netflix being streamed off of Amazon servers. And so when Amazon transformed its business into service offerings, its business enabled its competitors. And that's not something they're gonna teach you how to do in business school because you're supposed to be waging war against your competitors. But in this case, what happens? Amazon makes money from every bit, literally every bit, that they transmit through Netflix servers to a customer's home. That's a lot of bits. It adds up to quite a substantial sum. Netflix had revenue in excess of $4 billion in 2013. I'm sure it's going to be closer to 6 or $8 billion in 2015. And it's reasonable to assume that at least 10% of that went straight back to Amazon, almost half a billion dollars in revenue, because Amazon has built a service that enables a competitor. And in the connected economy, that's one sure sign that you're doing it right. Now, for many years, Amazon has allowed its customers to pre-order and to prepay for a book that hasn't been released because book titles are announced many months before they ship. But Amazon wants to capture the customer dollar from the moment the book is announced. So they built a payment service that would hold the customer pre-order until the book was delivered and that's when the customer would be billed for the order. So at around the same time that Amazon launched web services, they launched a prepayment service known as Amazon Flexible Payment Services. And one group of folks in New York City realized that that prepayment facility that was offered through Amazon Flexible Payment Services, which allows mm, a year to elapse between the pre-order and the payment, it enabled a new kind of commerce, one which would allow people to purchase things that did not yet exist. And so they created a website where people could pitch the public on their ideas and the public could vote with their dollars. And if the pitch failed to gain traction, well, the public wouldn't be charged, but if enough interest was garnered, the successful pitch would receive the funds months, sometimes years before the delivery of the actual goods. And if you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about the crowdfunding site Kickstarter. At its essence, Kickstarter is a skin over Amazon flexible payment services. It allows individuals to take pre-orders and to charge for things before they've been delivered. That's something that PayPal and pretty much every other payments processor is not going to allow because it opens the door to fraud. But Kickstarter has built a very tidy business out of this. They've raised well over a billion dollars in funding for a range of profits uh, products and they take a cut out of that. It's using services that are available to anyone. It's using Amazon Flexible Payments, which anyone can use because that service was designed for any developer anywhere. And that means that pretty much anyone can roll their own Kickstarter using a freely available software package called Self-Starter. I used Self-Starter myself two years ago. I raised $40,000 in pre-orders for a project. It worked well until I actually had to go and bill the customers because I was shipping. And then I found myself working with the ugliest, the most unfriendly set of services I have ever seen. 
we ended up processing about 400 credit card orders essentially individually. It's something that I wished had taken a few minutes, probably should have taken a few minutes, and it ended up taking a week. Kickstarter has a whole team to make Amazon flexible payments work for them. But even for them, even for their customers, it was a lot of work. And Amazon recently announced that they were shutting down Amazon flexible payment services. Kickstarter has moved along to payments processor Stripe. So Amazon flexible payment services shows that there's more to a service than just making it open. It has to be easy to use if you expect people to use it. And when it is, like Amazon Web Services, it can become a massive business. Where it fails, as it does with Amazon Flexible Payment Services, well, it leaves the market open to competitors. Now, within a generation, every business of any scale will break itself up into constituent services. Businesses will use services offered by other businesses where they present greater efficiencies. And they will offer their own services where they have the capacity to compete. In a connected economy, the ecology of business is much more complicated than anything that we've experienced before. Instead of the very direct, the very clear relationships between customers and vendors and competitors, we are starting to operate in a world where a business composes itself from services offered by competitors who are also vendors, while those businesses' customers remix those services offered by that business with other services offered by other customers or competitors. And so straightforward business relationships actually are starting to become a big tangle of interdependencies. And this is the framework for strategic business thinking over the next generation. But very few businesses are currently thinking in these terms. Let's, let's now look at how banking businesses are reinventing themselves as services. Part two, game over. One of the biggest businesses to IPO in 2014 was a company that had identified itself very closely with the sharing economy. And we're going to be hearing the term sharing economy a lot over the next couple of years because it's connected to Uber and Airbnb and Airtasker and there's a whole range of other films, firms. At its essence, the sharing economy uses the pervasive power and the connectivity of the smartphone to create markets where they couldn't exist before. So Uber aggregates drivers and passengers to create a taxi service that essentially has no capital requirements. Airbnb aggregates homeowners and travelers to create uh, essentially a planet-spanning hotel service. Airtasker aggregates people who need short-term labor and those who want to provide it and creates a real-time job market. And those are just a few of possible candidates that can exist for the new kinds of markets in a connected economy. I just found out about another company that connects people who want to walk pets or take care of pets with people who are going on holidays and have pets and are looking for people to take care of them. Now, another sharing economy company pioneered by U.S. firm Lending Club and Lending Club's the company that made that billion dollars in the successful public offering last year. What they do is they aggregate individuals with capital, with individuals who need capital. Now the Lending Club model, it seems really almost deceptively simple because an investor with as little as $25 can choose from a selection of applicants for loans and they can choose to invest in those applicants who fit the risk profile of the investor. And the investor receives returns monthly as the loan is being paid back. An applicant has to provide data sufficient to be able to make a credit assessment. That information is used to generate an interest rate for the loan. It's provided to the investors who might be interested in making a loan to the participant. So what's happened is Lending Club has created a connected market for capital. Hmm. And you know, that's what a retail bank does. Of course, retail banking isn't something that you would necessarily be concerned with. 
and you wouldn't necessarily be concerned with Lending Club until last month. You see, on the 15th of January, Google announced a partnership with Lending Club to offer business loans of up to $600,000 to qualified applicants. Now, just on the basics, that's a good deal for Google because Lending Club is a great place for Google to park some of its billions of dollars in spare cash. But the deal has the additional benefit of allowing Google to assist partnered businesses via loans rather than via direct investment. Google does invest in companies. But Lending Club allows Google to aid businesses that are part of the Google ecosystem but aren't a good fit for their investment portfolio. This is a win-win because Google gets to accelerate its own growth by accelerating the growth of its partners and it earns a tidy profit on the loan. And that, well, that's commercial banking. That's exactly the business you're in. And this partnership gives you a peek into how the connected economy could be eating your lunch. Now, once this model proves itself, it's going to get replicated. Companies that aren't as large as Google but have aspirations, they're going to build mechanisms to make business loans to the companies that they see could accelerate their own growth. And that will happen via a lending club or probably a range of other startups that will take the lending club model and clone it and improve it and then compete with lending club. And each of those startups will be offering themselves as services that can be consumed by customers and competitors alike, just as Amazon does. Commercial banking is on its way to becoming a peer-to-peer -peer mixture of capital services essential to the connected economy. That transition is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time to get those transitional elements underway. And it might be an entire generation before the process is complete. But commercial banking is already transforming. To quote science fiction author William Gibson, the man who coined the word cyberspace, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Well, we can see that future already in a partnership between Lending Club and Google. So where does that future leave commercial banking? Okay. Can you rethink what you offer your customers as a suite of services? Banks are, are arguably the oldest businesses in the service sector, yet in many ways they remain the most resistant to a decomposition into services that can be consumed internally or externally. But when you decompose a bank, what's left? Well, three things come to mind. Capital, contracts, and connections. Capital isn't as difficult to raise in an era of crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending. Capital is going to be even easier to raise as we add digital currencies like Bitcoin to the mix. Digital currencies are quite literally connected networks of capital, and we're already seeing individuals and groups launch their own digital currencies for specific capital purposes. The fundamental technology of Bitcoin, which is known as the blockchain, that opens the way to a new kind of contract. It's a contract that's backed not by individuals or by a legal system, but by the full faith and credit in the network. The two parties contract their agreement before a network of peers, and the peers digitally witness the agreement. Now, those contracts don't entirely replace the contracts we're familiar with today, but they offer an alternative that is faster and cheaper, and depending on the strength of the legal system in a particular jurisdiction, they're going to be more reliable. And so, okay, capital, contracts, what about connections? Well, connections are the human element in a world that is increasingly defined by computer-to-computer -computer interactions. Commercial banking is successful because it focuses on that human element. You draw on strong relationships with commercial customers, relationships that evolve into partnerships. And so when everything else is stripped away, commercial banking is a set of human relations connecting organizations. 
The knowledge embedded in those relationships grows out of experience. While experience can be recorded and it can be shared, it's impossible to duplicate a relationship simply by studying someone else's experience. You can't just clone it. The time invested in a relationship is more valuable than any capital or contract. Now, in a few years, when core banking functions have been translated into a smartphone app, and that app is powered by digital currency and secured by the blockchain, it's not going to be the app that matters. Business will center on who we connect with through that app. And this is where relationship trumps capital or contracts. Deep knowledge of your customers means that you can connect them to the business that can help accelerate their growth. The future for commercial banking can best be seen as a kind of business growth accelerator, connecting capital-rich businesses with complementary capital-hungry businesses. And the commercial banks with the strongest relationships to their customers will be obsessed with their customers' needs. They will be ready to meet those needs even before the customer becomes aware of them. And so rather than sitting on a pool of its own capital, this new model of commercial banking thrives by connecting capital efficiently and effectively, leveraging the deep knowledge that comes from a long-term relationship, something that no computer can do. A 21st century commercial banker will have broad and deep knowledge of a sector of the economy that's akin to a sector analyst at an investment firm. And they will have that together with a network of contacts to connect the capital rich to the capital hungry. The bank narrows itself onto a service layer that sits on top of all of that. Rather than hoarding billions of dollars of assets and encumbering the business with all of the associated regulatory requirements, the bank facilitates capitalization between customers through its network of relationships. And when you put it that way, the commercial bank begins to look a lot like Uber for capital. Flowing along the connections made by its commercial bankers, connected capital provides good returns while simultaneously accelerating the growth of the capital provider. The commercial banking business needs to focus on what best serves relationships. And in order to adapt to the new contours of connected capital, the bank will need to provide the services its employee needs to support the network of relationships that provide and require Capital. Almost everything else is going to get junked or will be outsourced to other businesses and to other banks that have a focus on providing those other services. Just as Netflix uses Amazon Web Services to deliver its videos to 60 million paying customers, you might use your services from J.P. Morgan Chase or RBS or Westpac when they serve their needs, or J.P. Morgan Chase and RBS and Westpac might use yours where they fit their needs. And the heart of the commercial bank is this network of relationships that embraces customers and competitors. So in a few years' time, you're going to be grateful that Google and Lending Club forces you into this transformation because you have a depth of knowledge in banking and a breadth of relationships that mean you don't really stand a chance that mean they don't really stand a chance against what you can do. But first you have to transform yourself and we need to look now at how that can happen. Part three, shall we play a game? A large bank comes with a lot of inertia. And inertia is a resistance to change that keeps things ticking over day after day after day. Inertia can be a very good thing because it provides a form of resilience. People and processes keep on keeping on because that's what people and processes do. But resistance to change can be fatal when change becomes the order of the day. Turning an aircraft carrier around requires hours and tens of kilometers. When you want to transform the operations of a bank with an asset in trillions, and hundreds of thousands of employees, and bound by regulations everywhere, that could appear to be a Sisyphean task. And if you try to take that transition in a single leap, a bank would fracture and disintegrate. 
parts of the organization would hive off and collide at speed with other parts of the organization. So anyone who floated such a dangerous proposal would be shown the door. I want to outline another approach, something more Australian, something with a softly, softly, gently, gently feel to it. Because from little things, as the song says, big things grow. Now, the methodology that was pioneered by Jeff Bezos at Amazon rests on the idea that businesses are, at essence, composed of services. Those businesses can be consumed by anyone. They can be consumed internally or externally to the business. So can you identify some operation within the commercial banking division that you can break out and isolate as a service? There have to be examples that come to mind. And once you've identified that function, can you define it as a service? Now, service design is a whole discipline in itself, but as folks who provide or consume the service, you should be able to get, make a good start on the definition of that service. And once you've got that definition down on paper, you can begin to think about implementing it. Now, creating innovative services within an organization is equal parts art, science, and politics. But business methodologies from the technological incubators of Silicon Valley can bring rigor to that process. Eric Ries, in his best-selling book, The Lean Startup, and I urge you all to get a copy and read it, he asks innovators to build testing and measurement into their innovations. So when you're designing and offering a new service, Ries advises innovators to test and measure the effectiveness of service offerings using metrics like customers and customer satisfaction and support requests, so on and so forth. All of those metrics help creators tune the service, constantly tweaking it to match the evolving needs of those customers who are consuming the service. If you don't measure, you can't improve. So for Reese, innovation is a form of feedback between talented innovators and customers while working in concert to create new services. Now you want to streamline your, your processes. One suitable metric could be the customer time required to consumer service. Once you measure that, you have a dial that you can twist to tune the suitability of the service to those who produce and consume it. You can test how effective the streamlining has been. And with those sorts of processes, small is beautiful. Do something at scale that makes it achievable so that you can learn from it and then apply those lessons to projects with a wider scope. Now, Amazon has a rule they call the two pizza rule. If the team creating a new service can't be fed with two family size pizzas, the team's probably too big to do good work. With small teams, you can design and launch services quickly you can learn from the metrics embedded in those services, and you can adapt and improve quickly. A small team building a streamlined service offering focuses on testing and measuring the results of their innovations. They put what they've learned from testing into a continuous cycle of improvement, continuing testing, constant measurement, if you have multiple small teams, as, and you will as this transformation progresses through your organization, then teams can be set up so they can learn from one another. And the mistakes and successes of each will add to the capacity of the other teams. Now, where a service succeeds, some other process is going to get disrupted. And that's going to make people upset. And that's going to put political shockwaves, ricocheting around the organization. That's the sign you're doing it right. As service offerings succeed, they cannibalize existing business units. That's inevitable. And that's going to cause conflicts in the business. That's also inevitable. So every service will need a champion within the business who can defend it as it begins to disrupt the existing business model. And without that protection, the more successful a service becomes, the more likely it is that it will be killed. And finally, the team will need to pitch the entire business, all of it, on using this new service. At the same time, the team should be signing up external customers to use the service because the true validation of any service comes when it becomes indispensable both to customers and to competitors. And 
Sales and marketing teams will need to pitch the unique evident excellence of your service. They'll be able to do that internally. They'll have to do that externally. Service revenue will grow and you'll begin to incorporate these new services into your business units. And a gentle and gradual transformation into a mid-21st century bank is going to begin. That's the theory. But every business approaches the process of transformation somewhat differently. It reflects their history, their personality, their peculiarities. The organization needs the will to change. And most organizations won't change until their backs are against the wall. And by that point, it's quite often too late. There isn't enough time to complete the transformation required before the business is overwhelmed by disruptive competitors. Best example of that lately is Kodak. But fortunately, these changes are just beginning. There's enough time for a commercial bank to streamline itself into a suite of services, focusing on relationships and connections to its customers. Now, executing well, that transition doesn't feel disruptive. It doesn't feel abrupt. The commercial bank simply becomes better at what it already does well. It sheds the parts of the business that are no longer essential to its operations. And in order to get to that promised land, you have to have a good think about how to streamline your operations as services. Design those services with an eye toward measuring their success. Sell successful services internally and to your competitors. Start today and you will completely transform the commercial bank within a decade. Thank you.